Johnson, and I am an entrepreneur. I'm also a researcher, but for today I'll be talking to you about my entrepreneurial experiences in Liberia. Uh, when, I, when I think about business and entrepreneurship in developing and uh, post-conflict context, this is really the image that comes to mind. Uh, I think about how can we be able to create better futures for young people? How can we uh, create opportunities for parents to earn income so that they can be able to invest in their children's future? And I think about this because it is my personal story growing up in Liberia. Uh, when you think about Liberia, what, do you, what, 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 what is the first word that comes to mind? Can you just take a moment and think of that? Well, I asked Google, and this is what I came up with. And it's very frustrating and it's very, it's very heartbreaking. And interestingly, I also, I, I did this sim search um, three years ago when I was starting my business. And this is the exact same list that came up. And I just did this two days ago and it's the same thing. So it, it really is, is, is very unsettling for me. Um, but let me tell you a little bit about my story and tell you about why I do what I do. So these are my parents. Uh, as you can see, they almost look like we're, like we're siblings, but they're, they're my parents. When, when, when they had me, they were in their early 20s, just out of college. Um, I'm 25 years old. I just, I just turned 25 a few months ago. And uh, at the time, Liberia was just coming out of a civil war in 1991. And my parents really didn't have access to jobs. And now they have a new baby. What do you do? And so my mom took out a small loan from a family friend, and she used that loan to start a used clothes business. They would, uh, uh, people would import used clothes and they would buy them, buy bags and sell them on, on the local market. And it was from the income that she generated from her business that she invested in sending me to school. She sent me to one of the best schools in Liberia, and that was where I really had the opportunity to get a head start and to really internalize the idea that regardless of my family's economic position, I had uh, everything I needed within me to be able to create my own path for the future. And I think that my, my humble upbringing was really what uh, instilled within me in this sense that I can do anything, I can be anything I wanted to be. And so when I graduated from high school, I decided that I wanted to work for the government. And where better to start working for the government than in the president's office? Um, I, I repeatedly send them emails all the time saying that I wanted, I wanted to work there and they eventually gave me an interview and I got a job working in the press office, in the president's, uh, the president's office. And while I was there, I also decided that I wanted to go to university abroad. And so I applied to several universities in the US and I was able to get admissions into uh, one, of the, one of the top schools there. Um, I got a 90% scholarship, and I was also able to convince the president's office to invest the other 10% uh, for me to go to college. And so I did four years in college, uh, and, and after college, I was deciding what do I do with my life? Do I stay on and, and get a job uh, as a management consultant or an investment banker, which is what all of my peers were doing, or do I return to, to Liberia? And I think it was really a sobering moment for me because I tried applying to several consulting firms, but I just could not... I just was not inspired at all to, to spend 40 hours studying for a job interview uh, because I really believe that my entire life up to that point should prepare me for a job interview. I shouldn't have to study extra time for, for job interviews. And I was thinking about my life and, and, and all that led me to that moment. And really, my story is, is, is improbable because the community that I was born in, most of my peers didn't even graduate from high school. And so the kinds of experiences that I had really were an outlier. And I, at, at the moment when I was making this decision, I, I just felt to myself that the only thing that really inspired me was how do I create opportunities for other young people like myself to be able to have access to educational and entrepreneurial op uh, opportunities to, for them to be able to pursue their own dreams. And so around that same time, I had a conversation with my aunt she used to sell palm oil. She used to travel to rural areas. She would buy palm oil from uh, the producers in the rural areas and bring them to Monrovia to sell. And she was telling me that she ran out of business because she couldn't find palm oil to buy, which really didn't make sense to me because, uh, I mean, I know globally when people think about palm oil, they think about South Southeast Asia and the environment. But in Liberia, 
palm trees grew naturally. Nobody realized the plant. There are uh, many rural communities where palm trees just grew by themselves, and anybody who can cut, who can harvest the palm, would have access to, to the oil. Um, however, about 35% of the palm fruit in Liberia go unharvested because the smallholders do not have access to machinery to be able to, to process fast enough. So you have all the palm resources that are going to waste. And one of the, one, uh, another real challenge that, that they face is production technology. In many rural communities in Liberia, people have to manually use, manually extract the palm oil because they don't have, have access to machines. Another big challenge that the smallholders face is access to markets. This is one of the communities where we work, and you have to literally put a bag of palm fruit on your head and, and cross this bridge because there are no roads going in there. So when you have these kinds of challenges, really it's, it's difficult for the smallholders to access markets. And so I started my business. I, I, I decided I was, I was not going to make a farm because the, farm, the farm's already there. The palm fruit was already there. The real challenge, it was a sort of last mile challenge of just having access to machinery and having access to machines. And so we would travel to those rural areas and, and provide these simple production technologies that enabled the smallholders to produce a lot faster. Um, so this is a, a motorized palm oil mill, and this machine is 90% faster, and it's twice as efficient in extracting the, the, the palm fruit. But in addition to the palm oil, which comes out of the outer layer, we also um, now have uh, a market for the palm kernels, because in the past, people would just waste the palm kernels. Thousands of tons would go to waste every year. Now we also purchase the palm kernels from smallholders, creating an additional source of income uh, for them. And we use these, 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 uh, these palm products to create consumer goods. So we're not just selling the crude oil, we are also adding value to them to create, uh, to create consumer and industrial goods. So this is our flagship product, it's called Kernel Fresh. It's a, a multi-purpose moisturizer, hair conditioner. Um, it's also a very effective anti-acne product, which is our key selling point in Liberia. So we've been very successful in marketing this for uh, young people who have acne problems. We also are making soaps with the palm oil and the palm kernel oil. And uh, there's, now there's a huge market for the palm kernel shells. In fact, just yesterday I was in Lisbon uh, meeting with a potential business partner because palm kernel shells are now are used as biomass to create pellets for, for home heating. Um, and we also are working on transforming some of these palm kernel shells to clean energy charcoal briquettes uh, because in Liberia there's a huge deforestation problem with people cutting down trees to make charcoal so we are trying to create clean energy from the palm kernel shells. And so really what we've been able to do is to add value to the traditional Liberian crude palm oil. This allows us to be able to create jobs and to be able to uh, create other opportunities for, for Liberians using the same local resources that were already there. Uh, in terms of job creation, we have been able to create uh, about 85 jobs so far, and we are transitioning more to what's marketing sales now, so our target for the next 12 months is to add an additional 25 sales agents every single month. And of course, when we add sales agents, we also have to add other administrative staff, so we can imagine how many more jobs we'll be able to create over the next uh, few months. Uh, in addition to that, the smallholders that we work with also uh, earn an additional 180% increase in incomes because now they produce more, they harvest more, we see them double their, their harvest rates, and they also have a market for, for the palm kernels, which used to go to waste before. We've also been able to generate a lot of international attention. Just a few months ago, we had the former British Prime Minister in, in our office in, in Liberia. And so I think uh, the question that comes to mind is how can we do this? Uh, and I get asked this question a lot these days. Um, to say how can we replicate what you're doing? How can we have more young people doing, doing this, uh, especially in a country like Liberia where it's very difficult to do business? And I think that there, there are several key challenges I want to highlight. Uh, one is, of course, as the previous speaker mentioned, access to finance. Uh, because a lot of the institutions were, were destroyed during the war, it's, it's, it's very difficult for the financial sector to de-risk uh, lending. Um, it's very risky for them to give out their, their loans because they don't really have, they don't know who's borrowing, they don't, they don't really have a lot of information on the, on the borrowers. And it's even more difficult for, for young entrepreneurs because now all the banks want you to have uh, non-movable assets. You need to have a house, have a land, um, 
have a farm somewhere. And I think for most of the uh, my peers as young entrepreneurs, we really have, have not had that, many time, that much time on this earth to be able to accumulate all those resources. And so it's difficult for us to be able to access financing. Uh, however, we are creating really innovative new businesses, the businesses of the future. And so if you look at uh, the fact that I mean, society expects us to be able to create innovations for the future and create jobs for the future, but really we're not re receiving the kind of support that we need, then it, it, doesn't, it doesn't add up. Another challenge that we have is, is access to, access to, to markets. Um, sorry, I, I, I skipped the first human resource. In, 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 when we had the Civil War, a lot, a lot of people left, and also people didn't have access to schools. So it's difficult uh, to find people to be able to do the kinds of work that we need, and then access to finance, and I also mentioned just now, access to markets. Uh, so when I, in, in closing, I just wanted to bring it all together to just reflect back on um, sort of the real purpose of, of why we do business. In, in other parts of the world, people do business because they're moved, they're motivated to generate returns on investors, which of course is a must, and to generate high profit margins. But for, for those of us who uh, reside in post-conflict contexts such as Liberia, it really is a social imperative. Uh, the government, in most cases, don't really have the kinds of resources and the capacity to be able to create jobs to absorb the labor force. And so we have to be able to look at, assess our own environment, see what the resources are, see what the skill level is of the population, and create the kinds of businesses that will put those resources to productive use and also generate uh, amazing uh, job and livelihood opportunities for, for many young people. This is a young girl I met in a small village, and I think the T-shirt the that she has on her uh, is, 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 a, is a rallying call for you know, what, kind of, what kind of society do we want to create, what kind of world do we want to create, and how can we be able to cre uh, create opportunities so that we are able to uh, ensure that young people uh, pursue their dreams and, and, and also achieve those dreams. And I think that we can do that by uh, creating opportunities for parents to earn income so that they can invest in their children's future. Thank you very much. Thank you.